Dr. Joel Furman, welcome to the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast. Thank you so much for taking Thanks. part in this interview today. My pleasure. And I've just finished reading your best-selling book, Eat to Live, and you've convinced me to give up olive oil and to start eating more nutrient-dense foods. And giving up olive oil is a really big deal because I live here in Spain and I've been having cold-pressed extra virgin olive oil and, and people think it's very healthy but apparently it's not would you like to tell us why well if you don't mind my book eat to live was written in 2004 and revised in 2011 but my latest book the most updated book is eat for life it's my new version of that but okay. still it's fantastic you're reading that was my very best-selling book for, you know of all times um yeah the you know um a well, i advocate a nutritarian diet that's a diet rich in plant-derived nutrients that have phytochemicals and antioxidants to slow aging and to prevent chronic disease because the major causes of death are heart attacks, strokes, and cancers. And I see those diseases as being totally preventable and the result of lifestyle and environmental challenges. And if we eat super healthily, our body is really protected against those diseases. Now, not only eating a diet rich in nutrients, but also, having a thin body because fat on the body sequesters nutrients away from the other cells, but fat on the body becomes a storage depot for toxic waste products. So I was saying a nutritarian diet is not about just being rich in nutrients. We also have to be moderately calorically restricted to make sure we're a favorable weight, not too thin, not too heavy. We have to be a perfect weight, be muscular and strong, but not extra fat. And if you're pouring oil on your food, it's fat. It's not just that it's fat, it's 120 calories a tablespoon. And it's fine for a person who's a professional athlete or a laborer in a field behind a plow eight hours a day, burning off 3,000, 4,000 calories a day to throw an extra thousand calories or 500 calories on their food each day. But for most people working on desk jobs, it keeps them fat. Now, fat cells don't just sequester nutrients and hold on to toxins. They're pro-inflammatory tissue. Fat cells don't get a great blood supply. So they spew out reactive oxygen species, creating an inflammatory state in the body. And that's why people who are overweight are higher risk of dying of infectious deaths, like, like COVID death, and they're higher rate of cancer. Fat cells also make you insulin resistant. And the hallmark of a short lifespan is a person who's insulin resistant, and they have um, higher circulating glucose all through life. All the centenarians, all long-lived people, are insulin sensitive, and their, and their glucose levels run particularly low. So we're taking. So we're saying now that oil, it promotes the the inflammatory compounds, the cytokines, the lipokines, suppress the immune system, make you more prone for cancer, and fat on the body also activates aromatase, which makes you. Um, higher levels of estrogen, increasing risk of breast and prostate cancer. And when I'm saying oil, all types of oil is a major contributory to this pro-inflammatory cancer prone state because it keeps people overweight. And you can't lose weight if you're pouring oil on your food. It's so rapidly absorbed. It's an appetite stimulant. And about 90% of the population to in the modern world in, the, in Western and industrialized countries have, have, ex, have too much fat on their body for optimal health. So if you're slim, and the other issue is, is that there's a comparison between eating fat from nuts and seeds, avocados and olives, or eating fat from the walnut oil, the sesame oil, the soybean oil, the sunflower oil, the olive oil. And we know that when people switch from oil to the whole food, the risk of cardiovascular death goes down by 40%. So we're talking here about even the Prevamid study. So when people switch from oil to nuts and seeds, they got dramatically redux reduced risk of heart attacks occurrences. So we're talking here that it's always the whole food that's better than the fragmented food. It's an apple, not apple juice. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's a avocado, not avocado oil. It's sesame seeds, not sesame seeds oil. If you want to maximize lifespan, there's so many benefits you get from eating the whole nut or seed that are not found in the oil from that nut or seed. I gave up um, oil on Saturday, so I'm on day four. And what I loved about your book, another thing is um, the advice to, or the recommendation just to make big salads. So I've been supersizing my salads and I'm now on a journey of discovering or making my own oil-free salad dressings. 
So that's very interesting for me. I'm finding lots of um, recipes online. So it's a very interesting, interesting journey. And, and I have, um, now, you know, I have over 2000 recipes on my website and we're teaching people how to make delicious salad dressings and sauces made from blending a little bit of nut or seed. Like for example, I'll make an orange sesame dressing with cashews, um, raw sesame seeds, which I toast a little bit, um, uh, some couple of navel oranges, a squeeze of lemon and a little vinegar like apple cider vinegar or blood orange vinegar whipped up, making a delicious dressing or I'll make a tomato based dressing with like thickened tomato sauce with almond butter and balsamic vinegar and a couple of currants and some roasted garlic and making an incredible dressings with whole foods instead of making unhealthy dressings that have just oil and you know and vinegar which is just empty calories so and it's fun we get we make great desserts like we make like a you know a, a bean brownie with that with that um with a little bit of, um, you know, with beans and almond butter, a little bit of a chocolate icing made out of avocado and tofu with cocoa powder and a few dates. So we're making delicious food, but we're doing the whole foods. We're not using sugar, we're sweetening with a date. We're not using oil, we're using sesame seeds and cashews. We're not using, you know, so we're, it's really a fun and delicious way to cook, but it, we're finding that it wipes out people's diabetes or they lose weight, they live longer, they don't get cancer, their heart disease melts away. It's really um, the, the, the nutrient, the dietary portfolio that enables people to age slower and live longer also can be effective therapeutically to reverse disease so people can get off their medications and not be taking drugs all their time, all the time. It sounds delicious. I'm definitely going to check them out because I've been um, experimenting with cashews and I, I've got too much mortar in ones. It's all a bit of a journey <laughs> just to try and get the right ones. And it's, it's delicious so far. And, and it's really interesting because I'm hoping what's going to happen is a few months down the line or weeks, I'm going to be like, ooh, oil, that's disgusting. <laughs> you know, right. so they'll become... Have you seen my, have you seen my Eat to Live cookbook? Because I've seen your, seen your website, so I've, I'm, I'm very tempted to join now. I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot of delicious uh, salad dressings on there because I'm a real salad person anyway. I do eat a whole foods, plant-based, organic, um, locally produced... Um, oh, wow, that's great. ...diet anyway. I haven't eaten meat for 25 years, so I'm whole foods, plant-based. And... Um, so I'm really excited about this, um, making my salads a lot bigger. I was having them on a normal plate big, now, and now they're really big. Nine-inch bowl, because not a soup bowl, not a six-inch soup no, bowl. No, no, no. A nine-inch serving Like a bowl. mixing bowl. I'm, I'm using a mixing bowl. <laughs> right, exactly. If you want people to have at least one big salad a day. Yeah, my green is going to love me now, because I'm going to be eating a lot more fresh stuff there. And on the topic of um, weight loss... Um, a lot of people have gained weight during the pandemic, myself included. And even though I eat very healthily, but oil, obviously, <laughs> you can understand why. But I've actually gained seven kilos. I've never been this big in my life. And I'm just like, oh, my God. Um, so what advice would you give to anyone who is, has an extra layer of pandemic fat? Well, they have, they're not going to lose weight if they don't get the oil out of their diet. It's this, mm -hmm. it's, they've been, they've been so misled and, and thinking that oil is healthy for them, that it's just, they, that they, they're not as active, they don't, they gain weight. And you're not gonna lose weight pouring oil on your food. So it's really sugar, salt, and oil. It's, it's the sweeteners. You know, we, even when we make a dessert, we don't put more than one middle date per person for dessert at night in the dessert to sweeten it. And a lot of the desserts are just, desserts are just frozen fruit, like frozen cherries that be part of a frozen jackfruit or frozen mango or, you know, or for fresh, it's not enough, it's fruit. So maybe once or twice a week, we might make a fancier dessert. We'd make an ice cream, like a chocolate ice cream with cocoa powder and a date in it or a brownie or some kind of um, fancy or, or a tiramisu with um, agar, agar. We make some fancy desserts a few times a week, but mostly it's fresh fruit. And, the meal, and people should be losing one kilo a week. And I say, if wow. you're not losing, if you're, if you're overweight and not losing a kilogram a week, then you're not following this program. A nutritarian diet affords people that opportunity to lose a half a kilo every three days. And if they're not doing that, they're not doing it right. And Let's it doesn't matter what exercise they do. Because even if they don't exercise, they're still gonna lose the weight because the food is very filling. It doesn't have any extra sweeteners or oils in it. And you eat, get to eat, you don't have to eat thimble sized portions of food. You get to eat liberal, liberal amounts of delicious tasting food and people find they are satisfied with less calories and they lose weight. I'm excited. I'm, I'm on week 15 at the gym now and I haven't, I haven't actually lost any weight. So hopefully with this, uh, the combination of massive salads and, and your plan and, and the exercise. And then, then when you're using nuts and seeds, mm -hmm. only use a half an ounce per meal. Mm -hmm. So you have a total of an ounce and a half a day. 
don't overdo the nuts because that also could produce um, too much fat calories. But, but, but I can eat more than an ounce of half a nuts a day because I'm not looking to lose weight. But for a person looking to lose weight, they should go a half an ounce per meal. So that's the one thing they're measuring where the vegetables and the other things they can eat more liberally as much as they want. It's always easier to prepare food at home, obviously, because you know how much you're, you're having. But what about when you are eating out or at a friend's place or at a restaurant? What do you think about cheat days? Well, um, most people are overweight because they've developed an addictive relationship with food. And the foods that drive them to overeat are the foods that aren't healthy for them to begin with. If they stay away from salt, the salt drives them, their salt craving, their sugar craving, their oil or fat craving. And the cheat days reinforce their cravings and the addictions. It's like bringing to an alcoholic to a bar once a week. Instead of getting over the cravings and having them fade into the past and they no longer desire those foods, by having a cheat day, they constantly throw those foods in their face and make them always thinking about them, always wanting them more. And they never cross the line between preferring this way of eating over their old diet. I wouldn't consider a cheat day for myself because I don't like those things you'd be cheating on or a person's been cheating on. They don't have any appeal to me because I'd prefer my the taste of my food better. I'd rather have my ice cream with the frozen banana, the macadamia nuts and the real vanilla bean powder, real food compared to the stuff that's overly sweet and I can taste the chemicals and bleach in it. This doesn't, but if I kept eating that heavily sweetened stuff, I would never appreciate the unsweetened, the lower sugar version of the, just the bananas with the macadamia nuts and the real vanilla bean powder wouldn't have much appeal to me. So what I'm saying is like here, like for example, we have this retreat in San Diego where people come from all over the world to get rid of food addiction and to lose weight. And they stay here for two to three months. And when they leave, they don't desire those cravings anymore. And they're, they're abstaining from those foods long enough period of time where they're not caught, they're not in, have this love affair with those foods, wanting them so much. So they, and their taste buds get stronger and change. So they prefer to have foods that are not so heavily sweetened and heavily flavored and heavily greasy and so greasy. So they prefer this way of eating after a while. And it, it makes for them to, it enables them to stay on the plan for the rest of their life and, and be, and get maximum enjoyment from it. When you have one foot in both worlds, you never really love, you don't really, your taste doesn't change all the way. And you don't really love eating this way. I want people to prefer eating this way. This is the way they, they desire to eat. And they'd rather eat this way than to eat their, the stuff that they're going to, that they used to like. Yeah, I think it's very difficult. But here in Barcelona, there's a there's massive um, vegan movement. There are lots of organic restaurants. But even if you go to a healthy restaurant, there's going to be olive oil and salt and all of those things. So if it's a predominantly yeah. healthy restaurant with just a bit of olive, um, oil and salt, would that be okay for one meal or, or is it going to be? It, de it depends on the person because for you or me, I can do that because I can eat one meal that has some oil and salt in it and I would not want that again and I would stay away from it for the next couple of weeks. It wouldn't make me into an addict, but for some people, having the oil and salt could make them, could throw them off of their diet for the whole week and they keep wanting more. It makes them want more of it. So it depends on the individual. The more you're a food addict, the more you have to stay away from those foods. If you're not a food addict and you can stay eating healthy the whole month and go out and have that once a month or so, and it doesn't make you want to have more of it, then it's, then it's no problem. It's like saying, well, if I smoked a cigarette, you know, one night in a month, it wouldn't have any negative effect on me, except if I was an addict and made me want to smoke more cigarettes, then it would have a negative effect. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And on the topic of, um, let's talk about diet and longevity. So what do you think are the best foods to keep us young? Any, well, any tips? It's a bit of a general. <laughs> well, here, I want people to memorize these five words and write them down. Okay. Because the most proven methodology to extend the human lifespan is moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. So those are the five words, moderate caloric restriction, micronutrient excellence. And I'm saying when we have the micronutrient exposure to the full symphony of nutrients humans desire, um, require, then it naturally suppresses our appetite and we feel satisfied with the right amount of calories and we no longer desire to overeat. So we have to be well nourished without, being without taking in excessive calories. Now the foods that consistently show in the scientific literature, the most protection against later life cancers and premature aging 
I have I give that acronym G bombs, G B O M B S, which stands for greens, beans or legumes, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. Greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. So the greens, of course, are the salad, but also broccoli and artichokes and asparagus and string beans and zucchini, all the green foods. And number two, the beans include lentils and split peas and zuki beans and soybeans, all the bean family, the legume family. And then onions, scallions, garlic, different types of berries and low sugar fruits and seeds like flax seeds, chia seeds, hemp seeds, which have dramatic anti-cancer effects. So g -bomb. so I want people to eat the salad, for example, and put some cruciferous greens on top, like bok choy, kale, collards, arugula, put some, um, put some green, you know, green, and then put a nut and seed based dressing with some scallion or onion in there too. To get I did those. that today. You did that today? Yeah, with my big um, baker's bowl. So I'm, I'm quite proud of myself, definitely following your, your tips today, definitely. Great. And another thing about, um, let's, speaking of aging, we produce less collagen and our skin loses elasticity as we age. And there are many supplements that contain animal collagen. There are people who think that you need to consume collagen to produce your own collagen. What do you think about that? Obviously on a plant-based diet, we're not consuming animal collagen and people have this perception that vegans are gonna lose elasticity or something. What, what, would you, what do you say to that? It's marketing, it's really not, yeah. it's not, it is not proven scientific data to show that keeps people longer. Uh, you know, I we're, we're talking about anti-aging phenomenon here. And the key here is being, and one of the secrets, and we could say the most foundational um, sciences to, that shows the anti-aging effects is eating more animal, eating less animal protein and eating more plant protein. It's not just eating animal, get rid of the animal protein, moving vegan. It's not getting, cutting back on animal products, eating more bread, and pasta and potato and rice and fruit. No, it's actually eating more high protein plant foods that maintain your bones, your collagen, and then the anti-aging effects and keep the IGF-1 not too high and not excessively low. And we're talking about high protein plants like hemp seeds, broccoli florets, lentils, soybeans. You know, we're talking here of um, quinoa. We're talking here about almonds, which pumpkin seeds. We're talking about all these protein rich plant foods, including the soybean, including edamame, dried soybeans that you soak and make into soups and chilies, and even tempeh have dramatic effects. Contrary to what people hear on the internet, there's dramatic benefits to eating some anti estrogenic effects on, the so on breast tissue and prostate tissue, and anti aging effects from eating some whole soybean in the form of edamame or dried soybeans that you make into a dish on a, re on a regular basis. Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, split ideas about soya. I think if people don't know if it's good or bad. I think if people, it creates a lot of confusion, I think. Yeah, there's been a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of backlash and a lot of billions of dollars spent to, um, you know, to bash the plant-based movement for the, the meat and dairy industry. And they've used a lot of um, soy bashing because isolated soy protein and processed foods made from soy have um, negative, can have negative effects and raise IGF-1 almost to the same degree as meat does. So there is, so we're not saying to use, like we don't want people to eat potato chips instead of a potato or eating, we're not having so soy fake foods, but the real soybean, the studies on the real soybean and using that as part of your meals show, show powerful anti-cancer longevity promoting effects. And the data is consistent. It's not, it's not, shouldn't be controversial. The studies have an overwhelming amount of evidence that these are lifespan enhancing foods. Are there any foods you rec would recommend to prevent, let's say the aches and pains and stiffness that's associated with aging? Well, you know, the, there's, not one, there's not one dietary portfolio that's gonna prevent cancer and another dietary portfolio that prevents dementia, and another dietary portfolio that protects against heart disease, or, you know, we're talking about the same ideal longevity promoting dietary portfolio that contains these green, these different, these categories of foods, protects against all chronic diseases and all forms of aging, including macular degeneration and 
skin premature aging and osteoarthritis of your joints and, and co collagen and cartilage destruction. It's the same program that has these beneficial effects on tissues. Now, some people, of course, you know, they're, you know, they, they could develop, they could be at higher risk of, let's say, osteoarthritis or wear and tear of the meniscal cartilage in their knees because they pronate and they're walking in properly, their feet are out of alignment and sometimes proper posture, the right orthotic, cooling their, you know, as we're talking about being having proper body alignment to reduce wear and tear on certain joints. It's not 100% dietary related, sometimes it's structurally related, but, but basically it's 90% of the time people are just aging prematurely because they're eating improperly and their whole body ages simultaneously. Their cartilage ages, their collagen ages, when their heart is aging and when their brain is shrinking, they're aging the whole body simultaneously. Fantastic. Okay, um, going back to what I read in your book, Eat to Live, some of your recommendations are very different from the ones published by governmental authorities on nutrition. For example, the pyramid you showed was the emphasis on, um, on grains, um, so obviously you say that the, we should have more greens. That should be the basis of our, of our nutrition. Well, in, the, in making a pyramid where the base of the pyramid is what you're trying to eat more of, my base is made of vegetables, not grains or not greens. The base is all different types of vegetables. Vegetables should be the base of your pyramid. And you can eat some whole grains and fruits and beans and nuts, but we're trying to eat a lot of bulk in our diet from vegetables. And that includes you know, vegetables of different colors, squashes and turnips and carrots and beets and, you know, and zucchini and different types of veg, pumpkin and squash and greens and peas. And so the basic pyramid should be vegetables. And we're trying to eat between a half an ounce to an ounce of nuts to each meal and about a half a cup to a cup of beans each day and then about three to five fresh fruits a day. So we're trying to eat a sense of a diet with a sensible variety of foods because all each one of these foods has power to extend lifespan and prevent cancer, but they work synergistically. When you have the greens, there's a tremendous powerful to suppress genetic defects. But when you add greens and mushrooms together, it adds more anti-angiogenic power to prevent cells from replicating. And if we add the mushrooms to the greens and the onions too, the greens, the mushrooms, and the onions together, then you get the most powerful effects and the most favorable effects in the microbiome, the right bacteria in the gut, thickening of the biofilm, so it keeps glucose low from foods coming in. So it's the whole pattern of foods that interact with the human body. And even the ergotheanine on mushrooms that stabilize cells in the body um, and prevent um, aging of organelles. And it's a product found in mostly in mushrooms that the body utilizes to slow the aging process. So if you're preparing, a, let's say a plate of food, because I've heard in the past from different recommendations that half of it should be grains, a quarter protein, and then a quarter veg. What would your plate ratio be like? I mean, that well, wouldn't be half of grains, that'd be way too much, of course. How, how, what would, would be the percentage then? Right, like we want people not to use grains. You know, vegetables should be the major source of their calories and their bulk on their plate. The grains, people shouldn't be eating more than one cup of grains a day. So most of us eat less than that. Most of us eat like a half a cup of beans, a half a cup of grain, you know, oats or quinoa or something like that. And we're eating more beans as a source of the starch. Beans in the soup, beans in the chili, beans in the burger, beans in the in the in the wok vegetable dish. We're using beans on the salad, you know. So we're using more beans than we are using whole grains. So I'd say at a minute, at a, if you're a big appetite, it might be a cup of beans and a cup of grain in a day. But if, you're need, but if you have a lower appetite, you'd be probably doing, cutting back more on the grain and not going more than half a cup of grain and being between a half and, and being, so you would cut a half a cup of beans and half a cup of grain or a cup of beans and no grain or a quarter cup of grain and three quarters cup of beans. Some, your carbohydrate would be some ratio there where well, you certainly won't want to eat more grain than bean, you would want to eat more bean than grain. Speaking of ratios, what do you think about mac macronutrient ratios? Is there an ideal or is it just like, would, would it, would it ha occur naturally when you are eating this way based on greens? Well, we, we have a high micronutrient per calorie 
Um, so we're eating a huge amount of micronutrients. Sorry, sorry um, I meant um, my mistake. Macronutrient ratio. You know the macronutrient ratio of proteins and carbs and, and fats. Right, right. Yeah. You know, well, the key here is remember is remembering that animal protein drives aging and drives IGF one too high and drives cancer. Animal. So we have the ratio is we want to keep animal protein down, but we don't. We still want to have adequate fat and adequate protein in our diet. So some. So there are some vegan advocates and people who promote plant-based diets that get people afraid to eat fat. And they want to keep the fat content below 10% of calories. And I think, in, I think the over, there's overwhelming amount of evidence at this point that's almost irrefutable that, that diets that low in fat are not lifespan favorable compared to diets that include more nuts and seeds where the fat content is up between 15 and 25% not below 10%. So trying to avoid all fat, including avoiding nuts and seeds, is not lifespan favorable. And the other problem is the risk of dementia and cognitive impairment and brain shrinkage with aging from people not getting enough of the beneficial omega-3 fatty acids in their brain that come from DHA and EPA. So the, there's a problem with the vegan diet, and that is some people need a lot more B12 and B12 deficiency could be a problem, but not only B12 deficiency, the other serious problem is DHA deficiency for the brain. And so we have to make sure, do you want me to quiet people down over there? Is it good to hear okay? I think it's okay, I think it's okay. Yeah, it's okay, okay. fine. So what I'm saying right now is that it's important for some people to supplement with a DHA EPA source and we make, they make vegan EPA and DHA made from algae. And if they're not supplementing to at least check their blood for omega-3 index to make sure their omega-3 index is above five to assure they're not gonna get brain shrinkage with aging. Because we're talking about longevity and living a long time. There's no good in living a long time if you don't have your mental faculties intact. And, and being on a vegan diet could put, you into, could put you into a risky state of, even though you're living longer, you could be demented living longer if you don't get those essential fats to, to support the um, brain health. Speaking of supplements, um, earlier this year, unfortunately, I had um, I was admitted to hospital with um, pneumonia, and as as I was there, it was quite serious. And um, they said, "And you're anemic. It's because you're vegan." And I was like, "No, it's not." <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I was on a mission, a personal mission, when I left the hospital to kind of really focus on iron and and everything. And I got some more blood tests about three months after being in hospital and everything was perfect, even the omegas and, and everything and B12. And I found that I actually had vitamin D deficiency. It was quite serious. It was um, five. I think it's below 20 or something is, is um, a deficiency. And um, I, I was looking into it. And I just think that, that people don't talk about this enough. People talk about B12 you know, in the vegan community. And, and it, there is a perception that that's all you need, you know, to, to replace animals, so to speak. Um, but I was really thinking about, you know, what do you think about vitamin D supplementation and also K2 and iodine? Because those are things that are not very abundant in a plant-based diet. Absolutely. And, you know, um, but just as many people eating animal products are deficient in vitamin D too, because it's the sun, it's the sun, sunshine vitamin, you know, so all it has nothing to do with being a vegan, but absolutely we need to check that and make sure we have adequate vitamin D. And by getting exposure to the sun, you could be hurting, damaging your skin, an increasing risk of skin aging, wrinkling, solar lenticles, and even skin cancer. So we have to be careful not to overdo sun and use a blood test if, to monitor our vitamin D levels to make sure we're in that fav most favorable range, not too little and not too much. To use vitamin, you know, a little bit of sun appropriately and, a, and some vitamin D to make sure you're right in that level. And you're right, the, the supplements I recommend for, for plant, healthy plant-based eater do not have folic acid and vitamin A and beta carotene in them. Because that's the danger is that people take conventional vitamins to get their zinc, iodine, K2, B12, and vitamin D. And in doing so, they're exposing themselves to ingredients that are dangerous, like vitamin A, beta carotene, folate, folic acid, which is not the same as folate in real food, folic acid, and, um, and vitamin E fragments, which people don't need when they eat healthy. So we want to give people, yes, what those things that the vegan diet could be low in, which you said are zinc, K2, iodine, vitamin D, B12, and I'm saying DHA, but not give them things that are, that can be, you take in these cheap vitamins that can hurt people. 
absolutely. I've been there ever since I came out of hospital and I'm on this mission to kind of be cured by my diet. I've been following my um, nutrition on chronometer, which has been very interesting. And almost every day I'm a bit low on calcium, even though I'm trying to have all the, all the things like almonds and, and broccoli and, and um, even some plant-based milk, which has got um, some calcium in it, been fortified, but that, that's quite difficult. But it's very interesting to see also the oil, how much that is. It's always been around 35% oil, nearly 60, 70 grams per day. And I think I read that in your book that, that you would consider that to be a high fat diet, <laughs> 70 grams a day. Just think of the amount you're diluting your nutrients when you have foods that have no calcium, when you have so many calories that are, have no calcium and no magnesium and no phosphorus yeah. and no potassium and no nutrients. So. And then you add salt to the people's diet and the salt has to be washed away and it sucks all the other minerals out of the body when they're taking in a high salt diet. So it's the combination between sugar, salt, and oil that has profound damaging effects in our population. And so the cal so obviously if you're taking so many calories from oil instead of eating the whole food, you're gonna, and beans and greens are very high in calcium. And there was a study came out of England that showed that vegans had higher risk of hip fractures and bone fractures compared to meat eaters and we analyzed the diets of those British vegans, and they were eating a starch-based diet with lots of bread and potato, and their calcium levels and protein levels were half the amount compared to a nutritarian diet. Their calcium levels were too low, and their protein levels were too low, and when you feed them more beans and vegetables and, and, then they, and nuts, then their calcium getting high and their protein goes high and they don't have hip fractures. Exciting. I'm really excited what's going to happen in the next few weeks as I follow this plan and with, with no oil. I'm definitely going to be checking out your website with the, um, with, the, with the recipes. And what else do you have on your website? I've seen, about, I've seen your Eat to Live retreat. Would you like to tell us more about that? That sounds absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I've been in medical practice more than three decades taking care of people. And I get so much pleasure in helping people reverse their medical conditions. People with heart problems don't eat you know, get out of the hospital, don't do the angioplasty, come here, we'll reverse it, we'll get you off the blood pressure medication, get rid of your diabetes. But so many people, they know how they should eat and they know they should eat healthier, but they don't seem to be able to do it in their own home environment to get started. And you need that period of abstinence and get your taste buds, re you know, retrained to love eating this way and learn the recipes. And we have a whole program here where people can jumpstart their program. And the minimum stay though is 30 days. We, mm -hmm. people come in for at least one month, from one month, two months, or three months. Some people stay, have stayed four months or so, but most people stay a couple of two months or so, and they lose a lot of weight. They may drop 50 pounds, but then they have the skill now to be able to go home and enjoy this and continue it and continue dropping the weight if they need to. So it, it sets them up to a whole new way of looking about food and taking care of their health in their life. Because, you know, people go away to these health retreats or these health farms or these fat farms, and they go away for a week or two and they lose weight, they eat healthy for a week, and they go back and they can't sustain it. They go back to their old diet and they gain the weight back. So we set this up here, this beautiful place where people can come and so when they, and they stay long enough. So they're like renting a room for two or three months. And the time they go home, they know how to cook, they know have the emotional, they change, have the personality and emotional intelligence now to deal with their problems and not use food as a stress reliever. And they know how to make food taste great and they're no longer addicted to those foods and, they're, and they really have the skills to really enjoy eating this way. So I think it's, it's a really um, you know, beautiful place. I'm here at the retreat now, but oh, I can- Wow, amazing. I, I could show you the, um, the back of the retreat where the we have right near the beautiful mountains and pools and volleyball court and pack, you know, here if we if you want to see we have people eating wow. breakfast here. You can see we have oh, that's incredible people, people eating breakfast here. And then we have you could see out the back window. You could see the swing <laughs> you see the swing pool out there. Oh that sounds yeah. amazing. Yeah, so you obviously have some emphasis on exercise as well then. Yeah, we have a lot of great we have a we have a great exercise trainer. We have a water water aerobics and and um, you know all types of um, great hiking trails in the woods, park right in its store with mountain trails and streams and waterfalls. It's really beautiful here. And then for those of us, or for those people who are not fortunate enough to attend your retreat, what other resources are you offering on your website for anyone who wants to? Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. The retreat is relatively, you know, in smaller numbers. Most people join the website where I can communicate with them and they ask the doctor for them and give them guidance. And I have a staff of food addiction counselors that work with people who have food addiction if they need extra personal help. 
But on the website, we have a member center where people can get recipes, menu plans, all types of supportive services, communication with other people, and, and if necessary, communication with my staff and myself to help guide them on their, you know, in their future health challenges. Um, hopefully I'll be sending you some um, before and after pictures soon as well, maybe in six weeks, hopefully. Um, so a couple of quick questions. What's the book that changed your life? What book did I read when I was young that changed my yeah, life? Yeah, anything that just kind of really inspired you. Um, I guess it was a book by Jack Duntrop called You Don't Have to Be Sick. Ah. It was written in the 1950s, and Jack Duntrop was a, um, a, produ a television producer who produced the series Hopalong Cassidy and, um, and The Lone Ranger, I think. So he was like a, here in Hollywood and he wrote a book, You Don't Have to Be Sick. And it was one of the first books on health I read, which made, wasn't that complicated a book, but it made sense to me that you don't, but people, and I was a teenager at the time, obviously. And people impressed on me the idea that people are ill because they've eaten and lived in a manner to earn disease. And disease is not luck, it's not predominant, it's not genetics. It's, and we can, we can control our health destiny. It gave me this idea that we are in control and we don't just have something happen to us, you know? So, and I think that, um, you know, I've gotten tremendous amount of um, pleasure and personal reward satisfaction from using these same principles I learned when I was young. So even though the science has advanced and we've modified our advice, the same basic principle is we're not designed to get sick. We're designed to stay healthy and well our whole lives if we live within you know, if we supply us with the right raw material. Sounds very empowering. Another question, which phrase or affirmation or quote do you live by? Phrase or affirmation? Well, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure of the phrase or affirmation or quote, but I always teach people this concept of what makes people happy. And the idea that very contrary to the modern world where people are like competing with each other, the countries are competing, people are competing, they're trying to be better than other people. And the whole idea that what I've learned from what I've read is that our ultimate happiness is having goodwill for other people, having compassion and trying to love people and love the world and, and the beauty in the world around us and appreciate things in the world around us. So contribute to the beauty in the world around us and have more care and compassion for people of all different types and, and appreciate what's, what the, the power and the beauty in all people. So we're talking here about um, the idea that instead of trying to look for things to be agitated, annoyed with, and feel, um, you know, looking for things to be negative, we have to look for things to be positive about. And the more we do that, the more we can relate and our happiness is based on how much we care and feel for others. It helps our, us feel better about ourselves too. Fantastic. So where can people find you? The best place is at drfurman.com, which, um, and they can see more recent works that are, um, they, could, they can read a lot and see videos. It's, so it's drfuhrman.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast. It's been a pleasure and I've learned a lot and I'm very inspired to continue on my, on my journey. Thank you. So, so happy you're taking great care of your health. Oh yeah, I'm really excited because um, I actually, um, I had a, an assessment at the gym and they said I was 30% body fat and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a kind of a skinny fat person. Yes, you should be low, the ideally for a woman should be below 25% body fat. For a man, they should be below 15% body fat. Yeah, I'm going to spin cycle in an hour, so. <laughs> you're, not that, you're not that far off. You just got a little bit, you just got to, drop 10 pounds. So how long will it take me? <laughs> two pounds a week, two, one kilogram a week. So it shouldn't take you more than, you know, six weeks. Okay, hopefully, hopefully. Well, okay. I'll send you a before and after picture and uh... <laughs> Good to know you. I'll be Good another luck. one of your success stories. Okay, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.